Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, University of Washington virtually uh, via Zoom. Uh, I'm Sasha Sindirovich. I'm an assistant professor of Slavic languages and literatures and also uh, at the Jackson School of International Studies. Um, and uh, I welcome you to, to this event with Professor Maria Sunovitsky from uh, Bard College, who will talk about music uh, and uh, Ukrainian sovereignty. Uh, I wanted to take a moment to just briefly introduce the event and introduce the introducer, uh, and, then, um, and then we'll get started. Um, first of all, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, the University of Washington sits on the uh, land uh, that touches the waters uh, of uh, Coast Salish peoples uh, in all the tribes and bands uh, within the Duwamish, Puyallup, Suquamish, Talalip, and Makashuk nations, nations which included and include generations of poets, storytellers, and singers of songs about this land. Uh, and I'm thinking about this today, particularly given the subject of what we're thinking about. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank uh, the uh, sponsors and co-sponsors of this event. Um, and this is Slavic Languages and Literatures and Professor Katarzyna Dziverek, uh, the chair, uh, and Lenny Phillips, our administrator, uh, the Ellison Center for Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies, uh, and Scott Radnitz, the director, and Phil Lyons, the administrator, uh, the School of Music, uh, and in particular, Shen, Professor Shannon Dadley, who is the head of Ethnomusicology, uh, and also the Simpson Center for uh, the Humanities, and especially Caitlin Palo, and also the Friends of the Ukrainian Studies Fund uh, that sits within the Slavic Languages and Literatures. Um, so this uh, event, uh, the, there'll be a brief introduction, uh, there'll be a lecture by Professor Sonovitsky, and then there'll be time for Q&A. Uh, this event is being recorded uh, and will be posted publicly on YouTube. So if you do not wish to be included in this recording, keep your video and audio turned off. All of you should have your videos or all of you should have your audios already turned off uh, automatically. But in case something something works, that's you know why. Um, and uh, you are uh, encouraged to uh, if you have questions, post them to all. Uh, in uh, in the chat function. If you don't want you set you to be identified uh, in the Q and A as somebody who asked the question, indicate that you want the question to be asked anonymously. Uh, so that's sort of the we'll repeat those instructions again later. Uh, so I wanted to introduce uh, my colleague at the University of Washington, uh, Professor Lada Belianuk. Uh, who uh, is a professor of anthropology uh, and is a scholar of uh, anthropology and language uh, in contemporary Ukraine. Uh, she's the author of Contested Tongues, Language, Politics, and Cultural Correction in Ukraine uh, from Cornell University Press uh, from 2005. And since then has written multiple articles uh, on uh, language and culture in contemporary Ukraine, including uh, in wartime uh, since uh, 2014. So without further ado, welcome uh, to this event uh, and uh, turn it over to uh, Professor Lada Bilyanyuk. Yes, thank you, Sasha, for, for organizing this event. Um, it's my pleasure today to welcome Maria Sunovitsky to speak about her research on music and sovereignty in Ukraine. And I've actually been planning to invite Professor Sunovitsky for two years now right before the pandemic hit. And I still do hope to have you come in person, but it's an honor to have you join us here um, on Zoom. Um, so Maria Sinovitsky is currently an associate professor at Bard College, where she moved recently after getting tenure at the University of California, Berkeley. She received her PhD in ethnomusicology with distinction from Columbia University in 2012. Her award-winning book, Wild Music, Sound and Sovereignty in Ukraine, which I have right here, and I recommend highly to you. Um, it was published in 2019 by Wesleyan University Press. Uh, it's beautifully written and it provides uh, insight into the dynamics of culture and identity in Ukraine. Professor Sinovitsky has also published uh, various articles about music in Ukraine, including on Crimean Tatar popular music, on songs of the Chernobyl region and of the Hutzels of the Carpathian Mountains, um, as well as on Eurovision and on Ukrainian rap. And she's currently working on books on the legendary folk punk rock group Vopdivido Plasova and also on children's music in the Soviet Union. 
Her work encompasses the complex multidimensionality of music in Ukraine, and she puts forward compelling ways of understanding musical worlds, such as her concept of wildness as a way that performers disrupt all kinds of social binaries. Beyond that, uh, Professor Sonovitsky is also a musician, an accordionist, a vocalist, and a pianist. And she's performed with various groups, including in uh, production of a recording Songs of Chernobyl for Smithsonian Folkways in 2015 with the ensemble Hilka. I hope that you can someday come to Seattle, that we can arrange a performance with you as well. Uh, as you all know, as we speak, Ukrainian city are being indiscriminately bombed uh, by Russian forces. Many civilians, including children, have died. The latest I checked, the official civilian death toll was over 400, but given circumstances, it is uh, likely much higher. Countless homes and schools and hospitals have been destroyed. Uh, 1.7 million Ukrainians are refugees now and the shelling continues. So some of you may ask, how can we talk about music at a time like this? But this is exactly the time that Ukrainian culture, including music, is so vibrantly important. It's a key part of what Ukrainians are fighting for. And despite being faced with an army that is eight times the size of their own, uh, not to mention the nuclear arsenal that Putin keeps reminding us of, um, Ukrainian soldiers and civilians are standing up to defend their land and their freedom, and, and the accounts of their bravery are inspiring. Uh, in my own research, I've interviewed many musicians in Ukraine, and I know now that many of them, including famous musicians, have re-enlisted in the army if they had the experience or volunteered for territorial defense units or helping with humanitarian support. Many are making public video statements uh, showing that they are there, staying in Ukraine, uh, doing what they can, and these are a powerful force in supporting people's morale. Like President Zelensky and his cabinet, prominent musicians and other cultural icons are showing that they stand with their countrymen. And music and songs themselves are very powerful. Uh, in yesterday's presentation, Sofia Fajora shared some examples uh, in the webinar, uh, such as Boombox's lead singer, Andriy Hlivniuk singing Czerwona Kalina in downtown Kiev. And this has one of the clips that has gone viral, picked up for a remix by South African artist, The Kifnes. And the Ukrainian anthem continues to be a powerful show of uh, a powerful symbol of uni unity and defiance as people gather to sing it uh, in invaded cities in defiance of the Russian occupying forces. And in particular, the line, we will lay down our body and soul for freedom takes on renewed poignancy as people are dying at the hand of Russian forces. A video was recently shared of a band performing uh, the Ukrainian anthem around a bomb crater in Ukrainian city, showing that material destruction doesn't destroy their spiritual fortitude. And there's countless videos that I've seen of people playing music or singing uh, in bulb shelters, drawing on the power of music to withstand the trauma that they're experiencing. So, so music is, and, and art, other arts are an expression of freedom. And that it, it's that that Ukrainians are fighting for, it's that that they don't want to give up. That's why they're not giving in to Russian forces, no matter how brutal the assault. So uh, before I turn the floor over to our speaker, um, I want to share with you just a few opportunities to donate to help the people of Ukraine. Uh, many people uh, have been asking about that. So uh, there's many places. We will recommend one well-established organization that provides aid called Razum, which means together. And Sasha will post the link on the chat so you can find that easily. And we also ask that you support our Ukrainian studies programming here at the University of Washington. Someday we do hope to establish an endowed position in Ukrainian studies. And for that, we have the endowed fund for Ukrainian studies. And for more immediate programming, we have the Friends of Ukrainian Studies Fund. And Sasha will also post that Slavic department page, or if you scroll down, you can find a link to support these two funds and they'll support the teaching of Ukrainian language and bringing in speakers and hosting events. Um, and we welcome your support. So without further ado, I turn the floor over to Professor Maria Sonovitsky. Hi, everyone. Good evening. 
you can hear me, right? Um, thank you for the warm introductions. Um, thank you, Professor Sandorovich and Bilanyuk for your swift work in putting this event together. Um, I so wish that it was happening under different circumstances, circumstances in which Ukrainians were not fighting for their survival. That said, I'm glad that those of you who have come today and those of you who may watch this later are listening and wanting to learn because we are immersed in an environment of very complex and competing narratives. For this talk, I'm gonna be drawing from material mostly from my book, which was published in 2019 and was based on field work done primarily between 2008 and 2015. Um, so in some ways, this is a kind of prehistory of the moment we're in. The book, as Professor Bilanyuk mentioned, is titled Wild Music, Sound and Sovereignty in Ukraine. And it is an anthropological study of music and sound in the period between the Orange Revolution in 2004 and the Maidan Revolution of 2013-14. The book is rooted in field work that was conducted in a few different regions of Ukraine. Um, so primarily in Crimea, in Hutsulshchina, which is a mountainous region near the Romanian border in the far Western corner. I'll show you a map in a minute. And then later a bit in Kyiv and in Poltava region, which is slightly to the East of Kyiv. So I'm going to try to connect some of the arguments I made in that book to the current moment of Putin's neo-imperial war against Ukraine. In the book, I examined sovereignty in three different registers, borrowing from the anthropologist Anya Bernstein's brilliant ethnographic study of Buddhist practices in post-Soviet Buryatia. So three registers of sovereignty. The first is at the juridical, political, or territorial level. That's the most common when we talk about state sovereignty. The second is at the cultural level, the level of cultural sovereignty, where we might think about things like language practices that Professor Bilanyuk has described um, in, in her first book, and also music. Um, and the third is at the most local scale of bodily sovereignty. So today I'm gonna focus primarily on the first and second categories, juridical, political, or territorial sovereignty and cultural sovereignty. Before I delve into the material though, I do wanna share a brief autobiographical note, a little reflexivity to situate myself in this current moment and in the research I have done. So I'm an American citizen of Ukrainian heritage, the first generation of my family to be born in North America. Both of my parents' families found themselves caught in what the historian Timothy Snyder memorably called the bloodlands during World War II. It's a counterintuitive history to many North Americans, and I'm sure many of you listening know some of these nuances, but in broad strokes, my family was caught between two giant armies and the greater immediate threat was the advancing Soviet Red Army. So they fled westwards and then became displaced persons after the war, spending some years in displaced persons camps before emigrating to North America. Uh, to both Canada and the US with their families. And this does not mean that they were Nazis. I was born in the last decade of the Cold War into an intensely anti-Soviet Ukrainian diaspora household where I spoke only Ukrainian until I started kindergarten and where my image of Russia and Russians was flatly negative. The Soviet Union was the evil empire and I was by extension, I guess, growing up in the good empire. Over many years of research, study, and developing personal connections to Ukraine, which I visited for the first time as a 10-year-old on August 24th, 1991, which is the literal day that Ukraine declared its independence from the Soviet Union, I have unlearned some of the morality tales of my childhood. My Ukrainian interlocutors, ordinary people, some of them musicians, some not, have helped me to see the world in much less binary ways. I have observed my home empire conduct military operations that were not done in my name, and I have protested. I have also apologized to my Ukrainian friends for the lack of US support for Ukraine after the Russian occupation of Crimea in 2014, when one of my Crimean Tatar interlocutors told me during a brief visit that I made to occupied Crimea in 2015, we understand now, this is a quote, we understand now just how powerless we really are and how vulnerable all of Ukraine is. We are abandoned by our state and our state is abandoned by our world." End quote. Over the course of the years that I've lived in Ukraine, which is close to four in total, as I have heard people from many regions of the country explain their feelings about Ukraine or Russia or the US, 
As I have read widely in many disciplinary traditions, I have expanded my sense of what Ukraine is, how we might define it, who claims it, and why they might want to defend it. That's why, as we watch Ukrainians fighting in an unfair fight for their continued existence, I, unlike Putin, apparently, have not been surprised in the slightest that Ukraine is viewing this threat to their sovereignty as existential and fighting with everything they have. I do not believe that this can easily be explained by the phenomenon of Ukrainian nationalism. Okay, so now you know some of these personal and professional investments uh, in the region, which of course risks undermining my credibility as an expert or as an objective observer. Um, so I do wanna add that while I have really no interest in sugarcoating any of the unsavory elements of contemporary Ukrainian society, including the presence of its real far right, the growing militarization of the society since 2014, its history of violence and corruption, I also think this moment forces us to make a choice. I've been thinking this week a lot about the famous labor union song, Which Side Are You On? Beloved by many American lefties. There are only two choices in that song and not making a choice is a privilege that only some can afford. So I'm gonna end this preamble with the words of Oksana Duchak, this is International Women's Day, so we're going to listen to what a Ukrainian feminist has to say. She spends her days. Uh, she spent her days before the war advocating for a transnational politics of peace, but this is what she had to say now. Quote: Some leftist people are saying that the way out is to negotiate and agree on the neutrality of Ukraine. It is hard for me to support this point at the moment. This position is a little bit colonial, denying also the sovereignty of a country. It is up to the people in the country to decide what they want to do and for them being able to decide there should be no war. As I've said, this war made, this war made decisions for many Ukrainians. People say there is always a choice, but most Ukrainians don't see a choice now. So later in this talk, I'm going to give you another example of musicians forced to make a similar choice at an earlier moment of Russian invasion. But first, I want to bring you along to a festival that took place in Unij, Ukraine, in July of 2014. So this was four months after the annexation of Crimea, after the illegal annexation of Crimea, after violence had begun in the Donbass and Luhansk regions in the east. And this was just a few days before Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 was shot down in eastern Ukraine by what we now definitively know was a Russian Buk missile, resulting in the death of all 300 passengers on board. So this festival was held on the territory of a decommissioned Soviet uh, Kolkhoz, which is a collective farm, on the banks of the Dniser River in the ivano frankivsk region of Western Ukraine. The village, which had a population of 156 people, swelled to thousands to accommodate the festival, which featured groups from Finland, Turkey, the UK, and Russia, among others. This was the 12th year of the festival, and the crowds that year were smaller than previous festivals I'd attended. So I asked one of the organizers about the muted atmosphere and she explained, quote, the, enti the entirety of Ukraine is depressed by the political situation. The intermittent rain, therefore, which disrupted programming occasionally seemed especially fitting. I had really wanted to catch the Sunday night program, the uh, so-called authentic program featuring a Hutzel group from the Carpathian mountains um, this was actually two Hutzel groups who merged for the performance and Crimean musicians who had traveled through the blockaded border erected between Crimea and mainland Ukraine in order to perform. So just quickly, we see the map on the top left of Ukraine and that territory that's in red is Crimea. This is for people not familiar with the geography of the region, obviously. And then in this corner here, if you can see my cursor, uh, you can see the distance between Unij, where this festival took place, and Zelene, which is where some of the Hutzel musicians came from. And then I know this is probably hard to see, but here's the Romanian border. So right now there are long lines at these border crossings of people uh, trying to flee Ukraine. Um, the Hutzels, the Hutzel people who have historically occupied the space of a kind of Herderian Urfolk of Ukraine played first. The Crimean Tatar trio, upon whom many ethnic Ukrainians and Russians historically projected racialized Orientalist stereotypes, played second. I underscore these distinct historical burdens of exoticism because I understand the choice to put these two quote unquote authentic traditions back to back as a claim to sovereignty, 
This is a project of articulating a state and reproducing it through its marginalized internal others. I was there that year with my then one-year-old daughter and my husband. So um, I apologize in advance for the extremely poor quality of the videos you're about to see, but imagine me uh, with a baby in one hand and an iPhone shaking in the other. Um, I'd like first to show you this just really short clip, 35 seconds of a Hutzel group um, that was playing in the makeshift amphitheater fashioned out of the ruins of a building at this festival. So you have some imagination of what that looked like. After about 10 minutes of music, the skies opened and nothing short of a biblical downpour commenced. Um, so the crowd was then directed into one of the bunker-like gallery spaces at the festival. In the smaller space enclosed, the acoustic instruments boomed, amping up the crowd who danced energetically. As the musicians played the well-known Hutzel men's circle dance called Arkan, I got pulled into the dance with my daughter in my arms as young festival goers mingled with local villagers in a jubilant approximation of the acrobatic folk dance. So this is all of 17 seconds of footage that I managed to capture before I got pulled into the circle. Okay, by the time the Hutzel set finished, uh, the skies had cleared again, and we went back out into the now muddy amphitheater and the darkening sky. The energy, however, had carried over from that bunker space, and audience members scaled and then danced on the crumbling stone walls. The trio played a medley of fiery chaitarma. This is the iconic 7-8 dance genre of Crimean Tatars. So we'll listen to that now. <laughs> Okay. After this medley of dance tunes, the violinist spoke into the microphone, quote, Ukraine is united, end quote. Later in the set, the trio performed a, this is a really interesting story that I won't go into now, but they performed a faux baroque composition that's widely known as Albanoni's Adagio, uh, which is one of the melodies that Crimean Tatars have adapt, adopted to commemorate the trauma of their Soviet deportation and exile, uh, which began in 1944. Then, even later in the set, they performed an instrumental version of the Ukrainian state national anthem. Because the trio performed instrumentally, the audience supplied the lyrics, creating a shared energy between performers in the audience that began to encircle them, some singing from high atop the crumbling walls of the improvised amphitheater. The melody of the anthem was elaborated with these uh, Crimean Tatar ornaments from the violinist and supported by the tonally varied sounds of the Dumbalek goblet drum. This uncharacteristic mix made the anthem sound to me less militaristic, quite lush in its melody and contoured in its rhythms. So instead of standing solemn, solemn and still, audience members moved their bodies in time with this new anthem and used their voices to howl and cheer when it concluded. The performance and its reception dislodged the anthem from its typical national setting by channeling it through an improvisatory kind of wild music. And that's a term that I'll explain a bit later. So now we're, by now in the evening, we're basically in total darkness. Um, so apologies again for the video quality. We're going to listen to a one minute excerpt. And in particular, I want you to pay attention to a point that starts about a minute in when you can really hear people's voices. And they're going to sing these two lines, one of which uh, Professor Bilanyuk referenced in her introduction. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so I've shown you um, this one example um, of this national anthem being performed, which surprised me at the time. I've taken you through the kind of course of the arc of this evening where we heard the Hutzel band and then we heard the Crimean Tatar band. And the next day at the festival, I was hanging around with the musicians and I asked them why they had played the anthem. And I was surprised by their answer. They told me it had actually been a kind of spontaneous choice motivated by the ongoing political instability. They were inspired also by the crowd and by the Hutzels who had played it earlier. It inspired them, as one musician told me, to make their claim as citizens of Ukraine and to, to enact that claim through musical means. So I propose that we might hear this national anthem as a collective and creative expression of a wish for sovereignty. So then we can also start to think about how technologies of the self in Foucault's famous formulation link to the political techniques of the state through affective practices, through musical practices. So I've shown you this one ethnographic example of nascent Crimean Tatar and Ukrainian post-colonial solidarity. Now I wanna briefly talk about a um, much more famous example. I've written and spoken quite extensively about this performance at Eurovision in 2016. So here I'm gonna contain my remarks in the interest of time. But I wanna highlight the following things before I play a little bit of this clip. The performer here, Jamala, is Crimean Tatar. The song that she sang at Eurovision in 2016, titled 1944, makes explicit reference to the Stalinist deportation of the entire population of Crimean Tatars in 1944. The song itself um, switches between the English language and Crimean Tatar and builds into it two references to Crimean Tatar songs. One is quite explicit. In the chorus, there are lyrics drawn from the, the quite famous protest song called E Guzel Kurum, which means my beautiful Crimea. And the other reference to Crimean Tatar song is more oblique, Arafat Dagu, which is an older traditional song. So to state it plainly, for Jamala to represent Ukraine at the Eurovision Song Contest with a song about the Stalinist deportation of Crimean Tatars from Crimea in 1944, only two years later after the occupation of Crimea by the Russian Federation, this was quite symbolically charged. The Russian Federation, in fact, contested the entrance of this song on the grounds that it was quote unquote political and therefore in violation of Eurovision Song Contest rules but the song was allowed to be performed and it, she went on to win the competition in 2016. The performance I'm gonna show you a clip of right now is from 2022, it's from a few days ago, where when Jamala performed um, at the German national selection for the Eurovision Song Contest. So in 2022, the song takes on another level of meaning, advocating not only for the sovereignty of Crimea and the Crimean Tatar indigenous population of Crimea, but for the whole of Ukraine. Jamala apparently raised 67 million euros with this performance over the weekend. And on her Instagram message where she posted the video, she wrote, quote, I am grateful to all of those who support our fight for the right to live at home, to build the future under a peaceful sky. Okay, so we'll listen to a bit of this. I'm just gonna check the time. I'd like to play a lot of it, but I'm gonna see how that goes. The strangers are coming. 
come to your house They kill you all and say We're not guilty Not guilty Where's your mind? Humanity cries They think you're God But everyone dies And swallow my soul Our souls the heart to cut it off um so this is again this is the performance of the 2016 eurovision winning uh song that was just performed over the weekend um jamala according to social media um has left the country obviously this was in germany with with um her child i think only one and her husband remained behind to serve in the territorial defense so the two examples I've given so far beg the question, what exactly is being articulated here? Is it the conventional story that we like to tell about music and nationalism? The one that you get in almost any introductory music survey, the story of music and nationalism often narrated through canonic composers, 19th century national styles, romantic projects of exclusionary national consolidation, I think in the Ukrainian case, we want to be especially careful with this kind of narrative because Ukrainian nationalism has been so overdetermined by outsiders, especially Russia, for centuries. We can see this now with Putin's rhetorics. This claim about denazification is an extension of this. This is an extension of a Soviet campaign to equate Ukrainian demands for rights with fascism. So, I'm proposing that we think instead here about music and sovereignty. Instead. Ooh. Oh, I had this cool effect that I messed it up. There it is. Okay. Well, you get it. Um, so I'm going to propose music and sovereignty instead. What does that shift allow for conceptually? Um, an affective attachment to the project of a self-determining body, a state. In a 2003 article entitled Maddening States, Begonia Arestaga wrote about the, quote, untenable hyphen, end quote, of the nation state, 
a formula that Ukraine confounds in almost every way, its history of imperial inheritances and its territorial incoherences, its linguistic diversity, its multi-ethnic and multinational population, the nation to the state with that untenable hyphen right in the middle. So importantly, despite the many studies that emphasize the violence of the state, which I do not in any way seek to challenge, we should remember also that the modern state is, also in Arishtaga's words, still the primary screen for political desire. Citizens imagine the sovereign formations that would best suit their ways of life and attempt to bring such potentialities into being through appeals to the state, most often. This is, of course, a process of dissensus and often a violent one. But I think it's possible to think about an alternative to these violent and often necropolitical effects of sovereign power, which have been so well detailed by so many others. So in this talk and in my book, I center on the potential of the sovereign state to enact a politics of care for its citizens, to allow citizens to determine for themselves how to imagine life in an imagined community. So many of us are probably well acquainted with Weberian state theory, but there's a dimension of that theory that is often underemphasized, which is the idea of the state as enterprise, the guarantor of ways of life. So as the Crimean Tatar case might show us, the sovereignty can operate at various scales. We can have sovereignties that are nested within the state structure or in other cases across state structures. Um, for Crimean Tatars, the alignment with the project of Ukrainian statehood suggests an indigenous sovereignty nested within it. It is a sovereign imaginary born out of a strategic choice to align against other actors, especially Russia. So I want to be clear that there's an important distinction in the chasm between the potential that a state would act with care on behalf of its citizenry and the reality of the violent and exploitative mechanisms through which state power is typically consolidated. Those are the better, the more well-known aspects of Weberian state theory. So I'm not trying to paper over that reality, nor over the specific and often egregious inadequacies of the modern Ukrainian state. In fact, since its independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, the Ukrainian state has repeatedly proven its um, incompetence and disregard for its non-elite subjects. It has failed its citizens repeatedly, but it has also offered them a choice. And many of them, against what a logical explanation might suggest, have chosen Ukraine and continue to today. So the second example, after these Crimean Tatar examples that I wanna to turn to, is a story really of ambivalence and of propaganda. It's of the Freak Cabaret, a band that markets themselves as a Freak Cabaret. This is a band that arose from a pretty cool scene in Kyiv, if I do put down my thumb on the scale, out of an experimental theater called the Dach Theater, which also has given us the uh, Dach Abracha, probably the better known counterpart. The Dach Daughters are the sister group to that. The Dach Daughters broke out really with this 2013 song called Rose Donbass. And when they emerged, it was really marked by their complete disavowal of the political. They had no interest in being perceived as political actors. And in fact, not even really as Ukrainian musicians. Um, this is something that I write about as a kind of privileged position, right? This privilege of not having to take a choice, the privilege of ambivalence which most of us listening to this talk probably have. Um, so this is a song in which, uh, the 2013 song in which they claimed that there was absolutely nothing political going on. Although the song uh, was explicitly about Donbass, which was the region from which the, the then corrupt president Yanukovych hailed from. And um, the song was released actually just a few months, the summer before the Maidan revolution. So I wanna give you a sense of the aesthetics of this band. And I want you to keep in mind as we're listening that they're sort of saying, there's absolutely nothing political going on here. We're just making music and we really wanna be successful artists. This is about aesthetics, not politics. Moon and sun, and lonesome can't 
This is easy to find on the internet, so I trust that you, that those who are interested will find it. Um, so again, this was just months before the Maidan protests began um, in downtown Kyiv. So just a quick refresher. I mean, this is really, really superficial. There's been so much written about Maidan. There are many competing interpretations of what actually happened. But what we can say briefly is that there were massive protests in the center of Kyiv. Um, as with the previous revolution a decade earlier, the Orange Revolution, many musicians came out. So that photo that I just put up has Ruslana, a well-known Ukrainian pop star in the center of the picture. Um, this is one of the iconic images of the Maidan Revolution, of the Maidan piano and the pianist facing off against um, riot police, basically. And then we should recall also that, of course, the Maidan turned violent. Um, resulting in the loss of over 100 um, citizens of Ukraine and some non-citizens and a lot of destruction in the center of Kyiv, which they had uh, fully repaired in my last visit a few months ago and now uh, is facing up for another round of uh, indiscriminate bombing. So the Dach daughters who had taken this position of um, political disavowal had a choice to make. And um, in early December, they decided to perform on the Euromaidan stage. So the, sta the, the revolution had a stage where many artists performed. They performed with a song called Hanusha, that's the, a woman's name, Hanusha. And later there was an 11 minute video uploaded to all these different platforms, YouTube and Vimeo mostly uh, was where I saw them, which sh saw them preparing to perform, you can see that in the upper left corner here, in which the musicians are talking to each other in two languages, as it's very common in Kyiv. Some are speaking Russian, some are speaking Ukrainian, and they're questioning whether these little intellectual things that they do, these little silly music pieces, have any place in the revolution. They voice a lot of uncertainty in these two languages over what is useful to do in the midst of a crisis as musicians. And I wanna just say that I know many musicians right now are feeling that viscerally again. Many musicians have taken up arms. And those of us who care about Ukraine and a lot of Ukrainians are also wondering what it is that we can do to be most useful right now. So to underscore this point, they had not wanted to be quote unquote Ukrainian musicians, right? Always in service to Ukraine. This was a kind of post-Soviet strategy of trying to distance yourself from really the Soviet trap of having to always be in service to the state. Um, but in this moment, they decided to make this choice and they performed on the Euromaidan stage. So they performed this song called Hanusia. And then later, one of their friends spliced it together with footage from the Leninopad in Kiev, which was when they toppled the Lenin statue. This was then um, uploaded to YouTube and Vimeo with English and French uh, titles, where it quickly gained over 100,000 views. And soon after that, it started to circulate with new titles, all kinds of different titles, variations on something like neo-fascist group Dach Daughters on the Maidan. So recasting the performance, as one by rapid, rabid uh, Western Ukrainian nationalists. So I wanna play, this is, this is my edit of the 11 minute edit. Um, and just so that you can hear a little bit of what the performance was like. Uh, the woman in the center of the stage, Ruslana Khazipova, um, had done some field work in Western Ukraine and had transcribed um, an interview with an elderly woman who had survived through the atrocities of World War II and basically is giving voice to this woman's story. She's telling this woman's life story and takes on actually the vocal quality of what an elderly Hutsu woman might sound like or what a young Hutsu woman might sound like, I should say. Um, and you'll get to hear a little bit of the full arrangement and see some of the scenes here. The piece ends with a well-known protest chant, which is when, if not now, who, if not us. So you'll hear that at the end voiced in Ukrainian. Чого в мене тільки не було? Хіба лиш по тій, чого молоко ми бракло, бирше бегмені чого? 
Та й бідувала я так, що не гараздувала у всяке було війна. Та я їла у всякого ніякого. Та й вижила. Слава Ісусу Христу! Слава навіки Богу сіденькому! So that's my rather inelegant um, edit. And so to be clear, the text of the, the text, Hanusia's text really doesn't have a strong political message necessarily, but it talks about the hardships of life and the predictions of the future, the hardships to come. Um, so nonetheless, this became circulated um, in these two competing forms, right? The Dach daughters in support of Ukraine or the Dach daughters as these kind of neo-fascists and specifically as um, Banderites, what I'm going to call in English Banderites. So I want to talk about this just for one moment because there's been a lot of ink spilled about this as well. Um, a number of the retitled Dach daughters songs called them a Banderite group uh, on the Maidan stage. And so when, we, when you see this term, this is another one of these um, terms that kind of gets coupled in together with neo-fascism, neo-Nazism, neo and it makes reference to a fascist leader from World War II era, but was creatively recoded and reappropriated during the Maidan revolution in part as a kind of answer to the Russian state media propaganda, which was depicting the entirety of the revolution as this you know, neo-nationalist, neo-Nazi fascist coup. Um, so here are just a couple of instances of the ways in which the Banderite becomes recoded, became recoded. Um, you see the Banderite cat here, Krimsko Tatarski Banderivets, the Crimean Tatar Banderite, the Jewish Banderite, um, the fish Banderite, right? The secret weapon of the Ukrainian Navy. Um, so there's no possibility for Ukrainians to be anything other than rabid nationalists. And even the Dach daughters who had had this long record of saying, we don't want to be associated with politics become slotted into this. Um, so I'm gonna zoom out now for a moment um, on the way towards a conclusion here or provisional conclusion for today and talk a little bit about what I call wild music, which is the title of my book. The research project really started with Ruslana, the pop star's Eurovision victory in, 20, in 2004, where she depicted what she claimed to be Hutzel culture, this Western Ukrainian high mountain culture on the Eurovision stage. I became really curious to know how Hutzels themselves viewed their represent, this representation of Hutzelness supposedly on the international stage. And that became the basis for my ethnographic inquiry. I walked around asking a lot of Hutzels how they thought about this representation, which opened up for me a fascinating set of questions about um, how discourses of civilization and barbarism were circulating in Ukraine at the time. Um, this wild music dimension also took me to Crimea where I did long-term research on Crimean Tatar, especially popular music revival in Simferopol, which has largely been dismantled after the annexation in 2014. And so this also led me to, to be interested in the phenomenon of Jamala and her ascent at Eurovision in 2016. Here, I was particularly interested in the ways in which this, again, historically orientalized indigenous population of Crimea was positioning themselves in alignment with the Ukrainian state project through their media practices. 
The project also took me to central Ukraine uh, in an interest into a revival vocal practice that is often called avtentika. This is a kind of, uh, let's call it an anti-Soviet folklore style. Um, and in particular, so my ethnographic research then made me interested in the phenomenon of the, of the presence of this voice on the reality TV show called The Voice of Ukraine. It's like the voice, the same, the same voice that we know here, um, whereby refusing to conform to kind of the homogeneous ideas of what a singular national voice is through the heterogeneous vocal practices of Authentica, they confounded these kind of unitary national logics. And then finally, I became interested in the cultural diplomacy work of the world music darlings, Daha Bracha, who through their also quite diverse examples of regional styles, fuse a form of wild music that has made them into extremely effective ambassadors from free Ukraine, what they call free Ukraine to much of the world. So for me, wild music, is when tropes of exoticism are strategically integrated into musical performance in order to make political claims. Wildness is the discursive formulation at the heart of my argument, and it grew out of these civilizational anxieties, we could call them, that marked so many of my everyday interactions with Ukrainians over the years, which was, we need to make a choice, and which choice will it be? Will it be towards Europe or towards Russia? Um, this discourse of wildness, I argue, has a genealogy as well. So the um, historian Larry Wolf wrote about the invention of Eastern Europe as a project of demi-Orientalism. So for centuries, this is in the record, right? Travelers, diplomats, and writers framed Ukraine as a space of liminality, tantalizingly close to the so-called spaces of civilization, but always excluded from them. This not Russian, not European inheritance is the space of sovereignty that Ukrainians have been imagining, I argue, in powerful and contested ways in the 21st century and often through these cultural forms. I argue that the discursive force of wildness has been harnessed by many Ukrainian musicians to remediate burdensome histories of exoticism in order to foster unexpected citizenly solidarities across the fault lines of ethnic, linguistic, and religious identity. From their borderland vantage, Ukrainians use wildness as a source of knowledge to rankle binaries of nature and culture, undermine geopolitical taxonomies of West and East, and instead motivate strategies of self-representation that defiantly center local ways of knowing and sounding. But I want to underscore again that this geopolitical cho choice is forced upon Ukrainians who may view both choices skeptically, but understand that their preference is not to go back to a revanchist imperialist project, which was marked for them by conditions of unfreedom and linguistic and cultural repression. There are many more examples that I could speak of, but I wanna leave us today with one last thought, which is actually a poem. Um, this image was tweeted by Olesya Khromeychuk, who is a historian um, and director of the Ukrainian Institute in London. She tweeted this on February 25th, the day before the escalation of the war and the full-scale invasion of Ukraine by Putin's military began. I'm gonna read you the English translation of the poem that she included below. <clears throat> Who told you that I might be weak, that fate I would obey? Who told you that my hand might shake, that word and thought are frail? You heard me sing a woeful song, a lamentation wail, but that was just a warm spring storm and not the autumn gale. These are the words of Lesia Ukrainka, one of Ukraine's celebrated late 19th century poets. You heard me sing a woeful song, a lamentation wail, but that was not just a warm spring storm, but that was just a warm spring storm and not the autumn gale. The poet uses a woeful song here to illustrate that the full force of Ukrainian defiance was still to come. I fear that today we are still not fully listening to the complex positions that many Ukrainians hold with respect to the project of Ukrainian sovereignty, which should also challenge all of us to think about what kinds of attachments we may hold to the sovereignties that we value. And so I'm going to leave it there for now. I welcome questions. And while you're thinking about questions, I'm gonna drop some links related to these bullet points into the chat. And while I'm doing that, I will also mention that the cover art for my book was made by Sashko Danilenko, 
who is a wonderful Ukrainian illustrator now based in the US and who has actually um, animated a, a number of Ukrainian music videos in recent years. Thank you for your attention today. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. This was a really wonderful, uh, rich talk. Uh, could I ask you to stop sharing your screen if that's um, appropriate? Uh, yes, I just, uh, coming back for just a second to explain how q and will work and then I'll turn it over to, uh, back to Lada Galenyuk. Um, so uh, we have a good half hour for discussion. Uh, and there are two ways in which you could ask a question. Uh, you could type your question in the chat uh, a reminder that uh, this is being recorded. So if you don't like, if you would like for your name not to be uh, mentioned, please note that this question is anonymous. And then Professor Bilen, you go read it anonymously if she gets to it. Uh, that's one option. Second option, you could raise your hand in reactions. So there is a reactions button at the bottom of your screen. If you go to reactions, click on reactions and click on raise your hand, your hand will come up. And then once, Professor Villeneuve calls on you, I will invite you to unmute yourself. You can't unmute yourself because there were over 100 people. So you are by default all muted, but I will enable for you to be unmuted once you're called to ask your question. So with that being said, I'll turn it back over to, uh, to, uh, to Lada. Yes, thank you, uh, Maria, for that uh, fascinating uh, presentation. Um, so I invite questions from everyone. Everyone, but in the meantime, while I can come in, while they come in, I will start with a question of my own. Uh, as you know, I'm a linguistic anthropologist, so of course, it's going to focus on language. And uh, it struck me, and I may have noticed this in the past, that some of the performances that you played for us uh, sing in English, right? So not fitting that stereotype of uh, nation building slash sovereignty building, and yet is it, right? So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about language choices, whether it's English or Russian or Ukrainian or Ukrainian dialect, and how those choices articulate in that um, wildness uh, and, and musical production. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think I'm going to first start by referencing the work of a linguistic anthropologist who I really admire, uh, Lada Bilanyuk who writes about the politics of linguistic non-accommodation in Ukraine. And that is this phenomenon where people will often speak in two languages at the same time and not necessarily switch to accommodate the other. Um, so I, I wanna just right off the bat, um, trouble the idea that Russian speakers necessarily want to be aligned with the Russian Federation. This is one of the facile and false arguments that Putin has been making for the last eight years, that part of the quest has to be to um, defend Russian speakers. And um, that is just not how the politics of language work in many Ukrainian contexts. That said, there, has, there appears to be a trend, especially since the Maidan revolution, but even earlier, of some people really consciously switching to the Ukrainian language more and more. Um, I might speak for a moment here about a different project that I'm working on right now, which is about this late Soviet Ukrainian punk rock band who were famously the first Ukrainian late Soviet band to sing in Ukrainian um, and definitely the first punk rock band to sing in the Ukrainian language. But what was interesting about them was that they were Russian speakers. So they spoke Russian. They were really in, as one of them told me, the Ruski Mir. You know, they were in the Russian world where everyone spoke Russian. That was just the, that was the lingua franca of the, you know, Kiev rock underground. But they started singing in Ukrainian and then eventually started speaking in Ukrainian. And for them, it took different, a different amount of time to kind of come to the, to the decision to speak Ukrainian. But I had this really kind of moving interview with one of the members, one of the original members of the band who told me that it was really only after the Maidan revolution that he started to understand himself as a formerly colonized subject and started thinking about his linguistic practices as a symptom of that. So he at that point in 2014, you know, made the choice to switch to the Ukrainian language. Um, and he said it was really hard at first and that some of his friends made fun of him, but eventually it became much easier. Um, in terms of the use of English, so I think probably the only example here that we heard English was Eurovision, right? And in the Eurovision Song also Contest- Also the Dach Daughters, right? Dach Daughters singing uh, Donbass. Oh, they, 
you're right. You're right. They're using, they're actually using a Shakespeare text uh, there. Yeah. They're declaiming a sonnet. Um, so <laughs> that's a good point also. So yeah, the doc daughters are fusing together. They often actually go to Shakespeare and they'll fuse together something like Shakespeare and Shevchenko. So Shevchenko being the 19th century kind of poet hero of Ukraine. And they'll juxtapose these poetic texts and kind of make this um, melange from all of these different elements that they pull. Um, Shevchenko, Shakespeare, and also, you know, a commercial that they saw on the television. So there's a kind of a, a real patchwork effect that happens there. Um, in the case of Jamala and the Eurovision Song Contest, that has its own fascinating history of rules around language use. Um, but it's not uncommon for singers to sing in English, uh, in part because that has become the kind of lingua franca of the Eurovision Song Contest. So singers who choose to sing in the national language will often sing kind of half the text in English, half the text in the national language. In Jamala's case, of course, however, singing in Crimean Tatar, which is not a state national language in Ukraine, takes on an additional dimension. This is a highly threatened language that has also been targeted and repressed um, and denied as a legitimate language. Over, um, over the course of the 20th century and now into the 21st. And so to have this kind of indigenous, and I'm using indigeneity here consciously, this is the political um, claim that Crimean Tatars have been making since um, the turn of the century, to use this indigenous language and to, and to state it plainly as a Ukrainian language is symbolically significant here. Um, I'm not sure I adequately answered all the aspects of your question, but those are some kind of opening thoughts there. Yes, thank you. Um, we have a question here from Lars Sveom Hansen, and he asks, have you found specific Jewish musical roots, roots, you know, R-O-O-T-S, R-O-U-T-S. Yes. <laughs> uh, what indigenous groups have contributed to Ukrainian music? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, and I, I was sorry that I didn't, have time today to talk about all these other aspects. My 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 focused research was really started off really with the Crimean Tatar and Hutsul populations, and then later shifted also to this kind of um, central Ukrainian, central Eastern Ukrainian village tradition. Um, but in a talk I gave last week, I actually touched on um, the Jewish question because there's no there's just no question that the Jewish presence um, in Ukraine. Uh, had a profound effect on, on Ukrainian musical culture, um, as did the Roma population. Um, so actually the Jewish population and the Roma populations shared, uh, shared in that these were both professional, you know, or semi-professional classes of musicians. These were musicians who were paid money to play music. So very often for weddings, um, you know, you would hire a band of Jewish musicians to play at a Ukrainian wedding. And, um, and this had to do with a lot of laws that restricted what, um, what Jewish people had access to do to make money in uh, the Russian empire or the Austro-Hungarian empire. Um, and similarly with Roma, it had a lot to do with the discriminatory policies that didn't allow Roma to own land, for example, similarly to the Jewish population. Um, but we have these professional, these what we might now call professional classes of musicians. In the Jewish case, we of course have the development of klezmer music, which becomes a kind of party music um, associated also with weddings and in which the repertoires are intimately bound up with what Ukrainians would also consider, especially in Western Ukraine, consider folk repertoires. So one of the examples that I played last week uh, put, merged together um, a variety of different tunes, one of which any Ukrainian kid growing up in North America would recognize as a hopak, but here is considered a kind of klezmer dance tune. Similarly, there's a lot of cross-pollination between Crimean Tatar repertoires and Jewish repertoires. And we've seen in recent years, some really fascinating um, collaborations between Jew Jewish and Crimean Tatar musicians as well. The name of the specific group right now is totally a top orchestra. Is that, is that the one? I am very tired. <laughs> I apologize that it's not coming to mind at the moment. Um, but we also see some really interesting um, cross currents in those repertoires. And the one that leaps to mind um, immediately for me is the klezmer tune that is sometimes called Tatar Tanz in the American klezmer repertoire, um, which is often played for the musicians out there. It's often played in six, eight time. 
also appears, I believe, as Bakhtcheraiskaya Haitarma in a lot of the Crimean Tatar repertoire, where it has identical melody, but it's played in seven, eight times. So the time change is, is slightly off, but the melodies are identical. Um, so we can think about this kind of cross-pollination of musical traditions on the territory of what is now contemporary Ukraine um, as a really rich field of inquiry. And there are people who are much more expert in the Jewish question than I am who have written about that. Um, and I would start with people like Zev Feldman and Mark Slobin for deeper knowledge on those repertoires, but it's a, it's a totally legitimate, wonderful question. Thank you. Uh, a quick question from Suzanne Frank. She asked, what language do Hutzels in Ukraine speak? Oh, uh, it's a great question. So, so Hutzels speak <laughs> what is often called a Hutzel dialect. A lot of Hutzels speak Ukrainian, conventional Ukrainian. This is pretty far, um, this is pretty far Western Ukraine and much of Western Ukraine speaks in a particular kind of Galician form of Ukrainian. But the Hutzel language blends in often Hungarian loan words, Romanian ro uh, loan words, and sometimes Roma loan words as well. So it has, um, it's a really fascinating um, linguistic culture. And what I can say, and you know, Professor Bivling, you probably knows more about this than I do, but when I was doing my field work there in 2008, eight and nine, they had just published a dictionary of Hutzel language, which was based on a text, actually a novel that had been written in 1940 and had been buried by um, Shukerek Donikiv because he was threatened with execution and had only been exhumed in the turn of the century. And then from that, they mined the linguistic practices of the earlier 20th century and made a dictionary. So we can think about these repressed language cultures and their revival practices as part of this longer sweep of Ukrainian colonization and post-colonial identity. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Shannon Dudley, who's an ethnomusicologist here at UW. Uh, he asks, Shannon. can you uh, can you talk a little more about the choice of the word wild and what it communicates that is different from indigenous? There's so many places in the world, especially the Americas, where indigenous identity and values are invoked as an alternative to state control and state boundaries. Totally. 100% agree with that. the second part of that statement. So um, I would put indigenous and, and I'm going to say minority and nationality into one bucket, and then I'm going to put wild into a different bucket slightly. Um, so I just want to be clear that, um, particularly in terms of uh, citizenly claims on the state, um, and there was a recent article written about this, um, indigeneity emerges as a kind of counter frame to the dominant Stalinist um, taxonomies, which prioritized minorities and nationalities. So to put it in a slightly simpler, simpler way, right, in the Soviet Union, protected classes were called minorities. And it's only in the post-Soviet era that we have a politics of indigeneity in a place like Ukraine um, that is actually becomes mediated through the United Nations. So it's actually, it's mediated through a supranational body. The United Nations has its forum on, um, on ind indigenous peoples. And through that forum, Crimean Tatars locate this kind of counterclaim that they are in fact an indigenous people, which is a legitimate claim. And through that, try to appeal to the state for protections as indigenous people, which um, is again, mediated through the UN. This doesn't actually occur until after the illegal annexation of Crimea it is at that point that the Ukrainian parliament finally passes a resolution saying that they, um, acknowledge that the Crimean Tatars are the indigenous people of Crimea, but by then it has, it's absolutely toothless, right? Um, so that is an unfortunate aspect of the story there. Um, in terms of wild and that specific choice, and I'm glad you asked the question because I somehow managed not to mention this. Um, so in Ukrainian, wild is diki, wild, wild people, diki lude. Ruslana in her 2004 Eurovision song contest <laughs> winning song, 
uh, one with a song called Wild Dances, Diki Tansi. It was first to hit in Ukrainian, in the Ukrainian language, Diki Tansi, and then later becomes translated in English as Wild Dances. So it interested me as a vernacular kind of term that was being circulated. And in, my, in the first stage of this project, I was going around talking to Hutzels about they, how they felt about this representation, how it fairly or unfairly represented aspects of Hutzel culture. And I found a very strong reaction to the choice of term. Wildness connoted something that really bothered some people and that really um, made others feel proud. So it became a really interesting kind of, to use the slightly outdated anthropological jargon, the emic term that I started to pick up on. And I will say that it has continued, it then continued to kind of shape shift in around different, um, in the lexicon of Ukrainian popular music. And so just as a, one sort of more recent example, we have this Ukrainian language rapper, Alona Alona, who has become quite a phenomenon in recent years. And I really recommend you check her out. Um, I'll write her name into the chat. But um, she recently had um, an, a song, I think just last year, um, called Diki Tansi again. So it continues to kind of reference back to this watershed moment in Ukrainian popular music. Thank you for that question. Um, let's see, the next question we have is from O. She's, uh, they ask, would you like to hear more, uh, would like to hear more about your Chernobyl Songs project? Oh, thanks for asking. Yeah, the Chernobyl Songs project um, is, is also easy to find with a Google search. Um, the short, the short version of this, the short story of the Chernobyl Songs project is that um, I had contact with a number of ethnomusicologists in Ukraine and um, was realizing that my ethnomusicology and their ethnomusicology didn't speak to each other very easily. We had really different concerns. We had really different skills. Um, we were asking really different questions. But I was really interested in this uh, singing practice that was being often called authentica. And that had actually been spearheaded by ethnomusicologists in the late 1970s in Kyiv um, as a kind of anti-Soviet folklore revival practice. And um, one of the people at the center of that was uh, Professor Yevhen Yefremov, who is um, currently in Kyiv. And, um, um, and sorry, and um, he allowed me to participate in some workshops with him. And I started asking him about his research. And he told me that um, in the 1970s, as a graduate student, he had spent time collecting um, the songs of the cave in Polisa region, which is what the kind of ethnographic name for what we would now call the Chernobyl zone. So he had these amazing field recordings from a part of the world that had been functionally depopulated after the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in 1986. And right at that time when we were talking about this, it, the 25th um, anniversary of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster was, was coming up. And I said, we should do something. We, we, I'm sure we can find a way to collaborate. So first we looked into the possibility of releasing some of his field recordings, but that wasn't possible because he didn't own them for reasons that we don't have to get into, but copyright is a funny thing. And um, so instead we settled on this, this, this idea that he would come to New York, that I would assemble a choir of singers, um, mostly people who had had experience in the Balkan singing world, most with the exception of one or two people, nobody had Ukrainian heritage or any connection necessarily to Ukraine. And over the course of six weeks, he trained us to sing basically through a ritual calendar year of songs so on the basis of his field recordings. So we were able to study his field recordings and study with him. And then we recorded it. And uh, in 2015, it was released on the, uh, on the Smithsonian Folkways. So it's kind of a strange project in some ways, but, um, but an, I think an interesting one. And I hope some of you might check it out. I wrote the liner notes too. So make sure you check those out if you do buy the album. Very cool, thank you for sharing that. Uh, we have a question from Jody Bourgeois. Hi, Jody. Um, she asked, uh, uh, translating the Cyrillic art polie. Uh, so actually uh, one difference between Ukrainian and Russian writing is that the letter E is a hard E in Ukrainian, whereas in Russian it's the Y. So there's about seven different letters. So art polie, 
and Paula, I assume, uh, Maria, it's field, right? Field yeah. of art. Yeah. yeah. Arat Pole, yeah, thank you. That's exactly right. Arat Pole is, um, they often call it a land art festival, actually, um, but they will write it often in, um, in Roman script. So um, Arat Pole, it appears both in the Cyrillic as that and in the, in the English. If you notice, the very first poster I put up was in an was in, in English rendition where it looks like Art Pole, which I sort of <laughs> is a little too bad. So often when I, when I show it, I put actually the diacritic, but they don't, they haven't done that in their own material. So yeah, Land Art Festival is the term that they use, but Pole means field. And so Art Pole, field of art, kind of. Yes, that is, and there has been such a profusion of uh, open air art and music festivals uh, recently. Okay, we have a question from Lucienne Brown. Uh, she says, I noticed the line about Kazakh kin in the national anthem. Is there any conversations among Ukrainians about that verse and the history or mythos of Kazakhs as it might exclude Crimean Tatar and Jewish populations? I'm so I'm like so impressed with that question and, and, and I'm so delighted to try to tackle it here. Um, so you're absolutely right. And I think um, it almost heightens right the strangeness of Crimean Tatars um, embracing the Ukrainian national anthem to the degree that they seem to have. Um, because historically, um, if you know the history here, right, um, the Cossacks, and so I, I might make a slight distinction between Cossack and Cossack, just for the record, but when we're talking about Cossacks in the Ukrainian steppe, these were historic, historically battling with uh, what was then the Crimean Khanate, not always, but often, um, they were in this kind of coterminous, what was actually called the wild field, Dikepole, um, and were often um, battling each other there. The very famous um, 1754, right? Am I saying that right? 1754, because it was 300 years later that, yes, 1754 treaty um, aligned the Cossacks with the Russian empire against the Crimean Khanate. Um, that's a significant date also because 300 years later in 2054, Khrushchev, who was then the premier in the Soviet Union, gifted Crimea to the Ukrainian so Soviet Socialist Republic. Um, and that is one of the historical arguments that Putin makes about why Crimea is actually Russian, even though before that it had been an autonomous republic. It's again, it's a fallacious argument. But at that moment in 2054, we should recall also, wait, 1954, I'm so sorry, 1954. So the, the treaty was 1654, my apologies. My math is very bad today. Okay, 1654 is when we're talking about the treaty. 1954 is when Khrushchev, because we haven't got to 2054 yet. Whew, it's been a long day. Um, 1954 is when Crimea is given to the Ukrainian SSR. This was 10 years after the deportation of Crimean Tatars from the Crimean Peninsula, at which point, yeah, thank you in, in the chat, um, uh, at which point the Crimean Peninsula had been effectively depopulated of Crimean Tatars. And many Crimean Tatars have spoken about the fact that um, after they were deported, um, ethnic Russian settlers were brought into Crimea and actually given the homes of the Crimean Tatars who had been deported. If you're interested in knowing more about this history, which is one of these kind of, you know, little known histories, I really recommend um, Greta Euling's ethnography called Beyond Memory, which collects a lot of these uh, testimonies about the effects of the deportation and the phenomenon of returning to find that your family's house had been occupied by, you know, very often an ethnic Russian, sometimes an ethnic Ukrainian family. Um, yeah, thank you. 1654 is the treaty and 1954 is when Khrushchev uh, quote unquote gifted Crimea to um, the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Thank you, Maria. Um, and I will just put that in uh, the, let's see, the name of that book in, in the chat, Greta yeah. Euling, Beyond Memory. Went to grad school with her, so. Oh, um, uh, anyway, we have uh, time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, Kade Roberts writes, uh, what role do Rusalka songs and related tradition have on authentica and popular genres in Ukraine? 
Um, that's a great question. So Rusalka, um, Rusalki are, um, uh, I, this isn't fresh in my mind at the moment, but we'll call them spirits, forest spirits. They're often associated with water. And they have actually very different, um, there are different ideas of what a Rusalka is in different regions of Ukraine. So in some places they're more associated with the forest. In some regions, they're more associated with a river or some sort of a creek. Um, and that varies a lot. In the Kiev and Polisa region, which is the region we were working on for the Chernobyl Songs project, um, the Rusalki were thought of as um, the, sp the spirits of people who had prematurely died, who came back to life once a year and tried to lure living people into the dense forest of Polisa with them where they would inevitably get lost and die. And so the role of villagers during the period when Rusalki were believed to come back to life was to basically shoo them away from the village. So in a lot of the Avtentika repertoire, we find Rusalka songs that do exactly that. There are songs saying, basically bribing the Rusalka to leave the village and leave it in peace and not try to kind of seduce people into a premature death to join them for that. Um, but there are a variety of different Rusalka traditions in different regions, and it's not contained only to Ukraine, right? This, this spills over um, the borders of modern states. Um, in terms of the popular genres in Ukraine, there's definitely been engagement with the trope of the Rusalka in different places. I think I earlier saw a member of Kitka in the room, so those people can also speak to the fact that there have been some really wonderful and kind of boundary pushing experiments uh, with Rusalka repertoires um, in North America as well. Mariana Sadovska, who is an incredible interpreter of traditional Ukrainian songs, did a project in collaboration with Kitka, the San Francisco-based um, Eastern European, primarily Eastern European um, vocal group, uh, where they reimagined the Rusalka repertoire in these really beautiful ways. Um, so it's, it's a quite prevalent uh, trope in a lot of traditional material. And there's also an opera by Dvorak. Yes, exactly. So like it's in the, in, we can find it in, the, in what is now the Czech Republic, in Poland, in Belarus, in parts of Russia even. So I hate to admit it right now. Um, thank you so much, Maria. Uh, we're just about done, but we have one more um, question from Carol Silverman. Uh, she writes, despite the false claim by Russians that all Ukrainians are neo-Nazis, they're neo-nationalists in Ukraine. Can you speak about their music. I would assume it draws from folk heritage like nationalists in other parts of Eastern Europe. Yeah, so just like in any um, other country, including um, the United States right now, there are definitely neo-nationalists. Um, there are neo-Nazis in Ukraine too. Um, unlike many of the neighboring Eastern European countries, however, they hold no electoral power in Ukraine. So I do want to say that the claim that Ukraine must be denazified and that ordinary Ukrainian citizens are held hostage by drug addicts and neo-Nazis is just a ludicrous lie. Um, the president himself is Jewish. Um, and this is not something that I'm really expert in, um, I have to say. But what I have noticed is a strong convergence in the rock scene, actually. Uh, a kind of radicalization in elements of the rock scene towards a, a quite nationalist politics. And in those cases, there's an interest in what might be called like pagan iconography very often and kind of pagan trends. Um, but it's not exactly, or I haven't noticed that it's really aligned with like the Authentica movement, for example, um, though it's not something that I have really studied very rigorously. Um, but I do think that there is that there is a phenomenon of like a particular kind of very kind of masculine coded um, hard rock music that has tipped sometimes into very, very troubling and dangerous ideologies. Um, I yeah, and that's right. Paganism has always been a really big theme in heavy metal and the ways in which it touches upon a kind of neo-nationalist xenophobic discourse is um, is something that Again, I'm sure people have written about, but it's not really what I've studied. Um, I will also say, and this is just a kind of like, just to make the obvious point that, um, you know, Putin's Russia has been funding neo-Nazis all across the world and in Eastern Europe. 
And one of the troubling, you know, there are many troubling um, phenomena in contemporary Russia as well, but it has its, its fair share of anti-Semitism as well. Um, and even just today, I was learning about something that's become viral on Russian TikTok, which is um, basically abusing klezmer music uh, to suggest that the current economic hardships that Russians are experiencing is, is to be blamed on um, the global financial system, which is of course controlled, as we know, uh, by a secret cabal. Um, so, you know, the anti-Semitism is, is real and there's an element in which, um, you know, the Ukrainian case is, is also very real, but is it, I, I just don't think is, is unique to the region and, and maybe not as, um, as advanced as it is in other parts. Although again, there are other scholars who study this um, more directly. But in terms of the specific question that Carol Silverman asked, um, I haven't noticed as much about the folk heritage, but um, I will say also that there has been a kind of militarization of Ukrainian society in the last eight years as the war on the East and after the occupation of Crimea. And in conjunction with that, there have been the revival of like kind of uh, martial arts associated with Cossacks um, that have been taking place and a renewed interest in kind of the rediscovery of a quote unquote authentic um, national heritage um, that I have to imagine tips into those, those areas as well. As the less, that's not the hopeful note I, I want to end on necessarily, but it is also true that that's happening. Uh, thank you so much to uh, to Professor Belenyuk for hosting the the event and for the Q and A, and to Professor Sunovitsky for giving the the talk, such a rich talk for us to think about. To all of you for coming and to uh, for coming for asking questions. Um, just a couple of things in conclusion. Uh, I I teach I regularly teach a course in Soviet film, and I'm kind of very cognizant of this you know kind of typical scene in a Soviet for, war film where protagonists at some point listen to the radio read newspapers and their latest updates from the front so I couldn't help but I have Twitter open side by side to Kiev independent right so while the stock was happening I see that 5,000 people have successfully evacuated from Sumy to Poltava Oblast which is oh, okay. a really welcome news uh the less welcome news is the International Atomic Energy Agency has lost contact with safeguards monitoring systems in Chernobyl about an hour ago. Uh, and then that there are air raids in Kiev, Zhitomir, and Vasilkiv as of 15 minutes ago. So uh, it's heart it's heart wrenching, uh, and uh, it's was wonderful to be with you all thinking about things that we don't know and need to know. Uh, we are at a university. <laughs> We're here to educate each other and educate the public. Uh, and, and I hope that that's uh, something that people uh, appreciated. I certainly did. Uh, uh, thank you all. Uh, and we will follow up with those of you who came. If once the video is posted, we will contact all of the people who signed up with possibly other links that people were interested in asking. So thank you all and good night. Thank you so much.